was a, this one Friday night in high school, and I was where I was many Friday nights in high school. I was at the mall. Friends and I would just go there and find something to do, some trouble to, to be part of, you know, those kinds of days. And I remember this one <clears throat> Friday night in particular, we were going to go see a movie, but we were too early. And so we were just kind of going around the mall, just seeing what there is to see. And I remember we were on the second floor. I don't remember the store, but I do remember that we started hearing a, a very loud noise. And so we went out and we looked down uh, over the railing and on the bottom floor, we just saw people running and not like one or two people, like it looked as if the entire mall was leaving, just a herd, just rushing out. And, but we had no idea what was happening. And so we said, well, uh, we went back in the store and we said, what's going on? I mean, did you get a, any kind of alert or notification? Is there a fire or a flood? And we have no idea. And the person said, I have no idea. Should we leave? I said, I'm, I'm 17. I don't know, you know. <laughs> and so... Uh, we, we did not end up leaving, and, but later we heard that you know, there were some kids who I believe were playing tag in the mall, and as you do, you tag your it, and they started running, and some other people looked and said, well, if they're running, I, I guess I should run, <laughs> and so people just, they just started running, and I do wonder if, metaphorically speaking, if the world looks at us as a church, and if they see us going in the same direction, and that's my hope, is that they see us going in the same direction. We don't have time to stop and, and to, to say even, you know, this is what's going on necessarily, but that we have a, an urgency with where we're going. And if the outside world looks and goes, I don't know where they're going, but I want to be part of that. I want to follow them. I want to go where they are going. If you have your Bible today, I want to invite you to open it up to Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to finish today our series on unity out of the book of Philippians. Uh, if you are new with us today, I too want to just welcome you. My name is Kale Courtright, the preaching minister here. And we are glad uh, that you are here to worship with us today. Something that you may know about me is I do not watch the news. I know the news, I you know, read the news, but I don't watch the news. And you may, be, you may be someone who likes to watch the news, you may be someone who doesn't. Regardless... I know what, uh, what you're thinking about. I know what's on the news and is grabbing your attention frequently. So here's, I would love to invite you back next week as we start a four-week series called Allegiance and how a Christian approaches the election season. It's what's dominating your news, and so we thought that we should talk about it. And so we want to invite you back next week. And I want to invite you also to be praying about this. I want to ask that you will be praying about this. I want you to pray for three things. I want you to pray for boldness from the pulpit from this time. I want you to pray for God's truth to win out in what we say here and what we hear here. And I also want you to be praying that we have open hearts and minds to God's truth. So join me in praying for that. And we'll be talking about that uh, for the, the rest of the month of September, and so I hope you will be here to join us with that. Next week is also a significant week for a very different reason, and maybe you prefer this reason, but football season starts next week, okay? <laughs> so that's going to be a lot of fun, and I want to invite you. I'm going to be wearing a Dallas Cowboy shirt next week. I want to invite you to, to join me in that. We're, we're laid back here. Have a good time. If you root for another team, we will still accept you. You know, I see a Saints fan, I see a Ravens fan, you know, all are welcome, though not all are equal. We you know, I don't know. So, I'm just kidding, Cowboy fans, we should, just, we should lay low. Um, but we're going to enjoy, uh, we're going to enjoy that uh, next week. In week one of Philipp this uh, series on Philippians, I told you that Paul is writing this from, in, from prison, and while we might view that as a setback, as <clears throat> something going up against the mission that God may have for us, Paul's mindset was different. And so we want to be unified in our mindset that wherever God places us is an opportunity for the gospel. And I think there's a lot of truth for you in that. 
Uh, wherever God has placed you in your workplace, in your neighborhood, wherever you find yourself, that's an opportunity for the gospel. Last week, we talked about we need to be unified in our humility. And humility is not just our mindset or our attitude, but it needs to lead to our actions as well. The humility that Jesus had is what drove him to the cross. Though he did not need that, he was driven there out of his humility and obedience to God. For him, humility was placing our needs above his own. And so, too, you should have that same mindset. That when you look around at other people, you should say, what is it that I need to sacrifice for somebody else? That is true humility. We want to be unified in that. And lastly, today we're going to talk about how we want to be unified in our pursuit. And so read with me in Philippians chapter 3 this morning. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put on confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Philippians 3 is one of my favorite sections of Paul's writing. And I feel like I say that every week in the book of Philippians, one of my favorite books. But here he is lining out for us what he's asking the followers of Christ to do. He's giving them reminders and he's giving them a path forward. Now, when we talk about the word joy, I think sometimes it's hard for us to really uh, wrap our mind around what it means. We, we have warped it. We have distorted the word joy. For us, we often think of it or use it in terms of being happy or having fun or something like that. But Paul here says, join me in rejoicing in the Lord. Join Paul while he's in prison is finding a way to rejoice. Paul has this hope in Christ. He has this joy no matter where he finds himself. Consider for a minute the church in Philippi. They have no political power. There might be some people eventually in the church that had hold some standing, but they do not vote. They do not, cannot run for office. There is, they have no political power. They have a government that might go to war on their behalf, but they will help them in no other ways. And so they, they get no assistance from the government in any form or fashion. Their economy is not what we would call thriving. And unless you're born to the right family, you have very few educational opportunities. Now, Paul is telling that church to rejoice in the Lord. That sounds to me like we might say, well, the world is not being fair to me. This is not how it should go. And Paul says to find joy here anyways. They live under what we call imperial rule, where famine is common. And at any point in time, your son can be conscripted into the military to possibly never be seen from again. You have no say in the matter. So where can they turn? Where do they put their hope? Where do they put their joy? And Paul says here, he reminds us and he proclaims to them that trust in God, being sure of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is the only place to put your trust. It's the only place to find joy. And what Paul says for them is a good reminder for us today. That no matter what you are facing, you still have that to put your faith in. You still have the resurrection to find joy in. But Paul here issues a warning. He says there's oftentimes other things that we, other areas that we want to put our faith and trust in. It's a lot easier to look at the things that we can control. In fact, Paul will give a list like this in multiple letters. But what Paul does here is he says, look at all of my human achievements. Look at my human resume. He looks at his ethnicity, his heritage. Look, I'm a, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, the tribe of Benjamin. Not only that, that I had the right education. I am a Pharisee of Pharisees, he writes. Nobody had a better teacher than he did. 
until he subbed out that teacher for Jesus. But, but Paul was trained by a very famous rabbi. He said, not only that, but I, I, I had such zeal for the law that I persecuted the church. And he was faultless. He was righteous. I think a lot of times for us, it's a lot easier to think about our human resume, our human accomplishments. In fact, if this is a warning for them, I would say, how much more is it a warning for us when our circumstances in comparison are pretty good? Paul writes this so often because he knows this is going to be a common human problem. That it's a lot easier, the things that we can see, the things that we have some control over, it's a lot easier to put our faith and trust in those things. And Paul says, that you must consider nothing. These are the areas we can control. Now Paul here, he talks about beware them dogs. That's how the Greek literally reads. Beware them dogs. Now he's not talking about golden doodles here. <laughs> what he is talking about, I mean, dogs were not well thought of in his day and age. He eventually says these are the mutilators of the flesh. What he is not so veiled talking about is about the need for circumcision. He's saying there are some in your midst that, that are proclaiming that you need to be circumcised first. They are saying that you must do this, check this box, jump through this hoop before you can have a faith in Christ Jesus. And he says uh, we might as well refer to them as mutilators of the flesh. These are, again, uh, things that we can do, human actions, things to put on our human resume. But his reminder is that you don't have to become Jewish before you become a Christian. Salvation is not something that is earned, not something that you do. Salvation is something that you receive. That, that is true for us today as well. He's going to argue that you cannot be righteous apart from Christ. The law cannot make you holy. Only Jesus can do that. The resurrection power of Jesus is what has cleansed us and made us holy in God's sight. Now, I have been told that when, when uh, kids turn 16 and you uh, want to help them become drivers, that it's very expensive. And so I did the math, and I, at some point in time, will have a 21-year-old, 19-year-old, and 16-year-old son. And on those days, we'll pass the basket every week <laughs> for them, not for me, for them. Uh, and I remember when I turned 16 and my parents were saying, hey, you're going to have to uh, provide, a, you're going to have to help a little bit with this to, to pay for your car insurance needs. And they said, it's very expensive for you. And I said, why? I, I, my, my record is spotless. <laughs> I haven't done anything. And that's a, that's a pretty good metaphor for what Paul is saying here. He's saying, my record was spotless. And they said, yeah, but you don't have the one thing that matters. You don't have Jesus yet. You might be faultless, but it is nothing compared to having Jesus. And he'll say that very directly here, starting in verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. This is an inspiring passage from Paul. And he's going to start, he's going to just use some very basic accounting terms. He's literally using financial terms from his day. And he's saying, look at this, there's things that we would put on our side of the ledger, our heritage, our education, our religious acts, all these things, these are in the positive side, and he's saying, you know what, take it out and just strike it. Consider it a loss. It's nothing. And that, that, there is something about that, again, for us, a lot of times, the more that we have, the harder it is for us to have faith. The more that we rely on these things that we can tangibly control or see, the harder it is for us to have faith. And he said, I consider them garbage. 
Now, he starts, he says, I consider them nothing. And I don't know about you, but I might rather have nothing than garbage. Because the word that Paul uses here, I'm not going to get too descriptive, it's not, it could be used for garbage, but it is also commonly used for dung in his day and age. Okay? He's using the most grotesque term he can think of. These things that we put our faith and hope and trust in, it's garbage. It's nothing. It's making it harder, not easier. We should consider all of this garbage. What he's telling us here is that we will find true unity when we consider all of these human things trash in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord. What we see here is that unity for us is built on our shared faith, not on our works. We're, we all come in here individually, and we have all kinds of gifts and talents and things that God has done and will do through us, but that is not what our unity is built on. Our unity is built on what Jesus has done, our faith in him. I've been talking about these human things that Paul leans on, our heritage, our education, economic advantage, social standing, political power, all of these are earthly values, earthly metrics. But we do the same thing in church, don't we? Paul might have said, look at my Sabbath keeping. Look at my, look at the circumcision. Look at the food laws. Look at the Torah keeping. And I think we do the same thing today. We might say, look at my church attendance. Look at my generosity. I, I'm a pretty good person. My morals are really good. All of that is nothing. All of that he considers garbage. Now, another way to phrase that is that these are of secondary importance. Don't hear me say church attendance is bad or that we don't want you to be here. This is, again, a, a great way to start your week, to walk with Christ with the family of God, but if they move off of our secondary importance into our first priority, that's when we have a problem. It's not about your church attendance or your generosity or your good morals. Those are helpful. You need to, to be those kind of people, but they cannot take priority in your life. Knowing Christ, your relationship with him is of first importance. Paul here says it's not about hedging your bets, about just being concerned about where you go when you die. He's speaking about the fullness of the relationship he's calling you into. That you can have this deep, abiding relationship with Jesus. And that's, who, and that's what he's calling you to. This is a hopeful message that you can have this personal relationship with him. There are other religions today, and there were in Paul's day and age, that you could not have a personal relationship with your God. That you needed some kind of priest, some kind of intermediary to go before you. What he's reminding us here is that you can have that kind of relationship with Jesus. That you can go to him. Paul is placing such a high value on this. I wonder if we can catch it. I wonder if we can truly understand what he's calling us to. That nothing on earth compares to this type of relationship. So the question for you this morning is, what are you pursuing? What are you pursuing in your life? I've said it each of these three weeks, but Paul here reiterates again this idea about participation. That it make, he makes it very clear for us that we are called into the Jesus story. That as we grow, we consider putting other people above ourselves. That we may face, most likely will face some kind of suffering, some kind of setback. For Paul, it landed him in prison, and he says, it's worth it. Paul over and over again uses this word suffering so much so that I told you a few weeks ago that if I were his editor, I'd be like, hey, let's maybe tone it down on that. We're trying to get people on board here. Save it for the end when there, there are no, you know, backs. There's no, no outs here. Now, let me be clear about what Paul is talking about when he says suffering. What Paul is not saying is that when, you know, you have a right and you share it with somebody else, he's not calling that suffering. Paul is in prison because he was proclaiming who Jesus Christ was and was arrested because of it. When you walk into a store in a couple months and somebody says, happy holidays, that's not persecution. That's not suffering. What he's saying is that if you live a life that is proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord, as the only God, and you're arrested for that, that's the kind of persecution he's talking about. 
That's the kind of suffering he's talking about. All these other things pale in comparison. And so if you live a life of testimony to Christ, that might lead you to some kind of suffering. And for us, unity in the church is when we experience the resurrection power of Jesus and share in that suffering together. That when we face hardship because of our testimony about what Jesus has done in our life, that's when we share that suffering together as a church. We, share, we are called to share in his sufferings, becoming like Jesus as we learn to turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile, and in that we trust that God will vindicate us. We don't have to justify ourselves, but we so believe in the power of the resurrection that we say, come what may. We have faith that God will bring us back to life one day. Paul continues this thought in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. When I read this, I, I love this language of that Christ Jesus takes hold of us. And in my mind, I, I have this image of that we as his children are, are essentially babies if not toddlers so reliant on him and in that moment christ jesus takes hold of us and he's holding us in his arms and there's nothing we could do without him i think that's the image that that paul is trying to get across to us today no matter what you put on your human resume this is who you are in your relationship with christ jesus everything else is nothing until you are being held by him. See, our relationship with God is one that was initiated by him. That before you knew his name, he reached out to you. He bent down to care for you. That he knew your name and pursued you before you knew him. And Paul here gives us this sports language, this goal, this pressing forward that this what are we pressing towards what are we pursuing we have a goal that we want to attain someday and that's life with him and so we strive for that do we share paul's passion today do we share paul's passion for this kind of relationship with god this kind of relationship with christ see often in in a church or in christianity we talk about getting to know yourself what are the talents that you have what are the gifts that god's given you those are good things we want to use those but having a gift having talent that's not the goal the goal is unity with christ the goal is for us to continue to be transformed in his image and to become christ-like to follow him wherever he leads us what are you pursuing I don't know what you would have said earlier today, but when you come, came into this room, ask yourself, what are you pursuing in life? Paul here is giving us this vision as, of Christ followers who will be obedient to Christ and be willing to be molded in ways that might be uncomfortable or sometimes even unfair, and yet to continue to press on for the goal of being with Christ. What we see here is that our future resurrection hopes must shape our present reality. So what we consider in the future, the resurrection that will be ours, it has to shape our present reality of who we are, of what we're going for, of how we choose to live. It's not just a, a hope for the future, but it is who we are called to be today, people shaped by the cross of Jesus Christ, shaped by his resurrection. And so Paul ends this by saying, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of such things. I don't know if you consider yourself mature today, but he says, all of us who are mature 
should take such a view of things. If at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. We're called to this maturity in Christ, where we stand firm in the faith, no matter what the world puts in our way. No matter if it's setbacks or suffering or imprisonment like Paul had, But this is true unity going forward. All of us maturing in Christ together. True unity is looking forward towards heaven together. I think in almost any other context, when we talk about unity, we talk about it different than we talk about it at church. There is not another group that I know of or civic organization that I know of that It does not have some kind of prerequisite for being part of the group. The thing that we unify around is the prerequisite for wanting to be part of the group. You join a club because you want to, whatever, a golf club, a sports club, whatever it is. Our unity here is different. We're not defined by who we were or any type of prerequisite. We're defined by where we're going. And so I love this image that Paul gives us today, that we are pressing forward. That our eyes, we don't want to be distracted by what's to the right or left of us by looking down, but we want to press forward towards the goal. We haven't attained it yet, but Paul is assured, and you can be too, that we will one day. And this is what unity looks like in the church, is that as we stand together, that we're pressing forward together, that oftentimes we may get distracted looking to the right or to the left. That's when we have the body of Christ that says, continue to press forward. When we stumble in our goal, when we start to veer off the path, we have the body of Christ that says, press forward in your goal. Keep your eyes forward, fixed on the cross of Christ, and keep pressing towards that. I don't know what you're pursuing today, but that's what I want to pursue. As a church family, this is what we want to pursue together. We're a church. And, and we're not, there are no mistaking what, we're, our, what we are about here. We are about Christ's likeness, helping one another press forward to that goal. As we close today, our shepherds and their wives will be around the room. And you might have walked into this room today not not knowing how you're going to bear the burdens that you have, not knowing where to turn, maybe being honest with one another and saying, I've been pursuing all the wrong things. And today it's time to forget those things, to drop those off and to pursue Christ together. That's what we are about as a church. So if we can help you with anything, won't you come while we stand and sing?